Hello students, this is your professor, Dr. Mink, and welcome to the lecture for chapter three from our Java Foundations textbook. In this chapter, we will cover using classes and objects, a critical component of this course moving forward. Here we have a list of the main subjects or topics that we're gonna cover in this lecture. Obviously, we're going to start with creating objects. Um, we'll cover services of the string class, the API, the Java, Java API class library, um, uh, random and math classes, some output formatting. We will introduce enum, I'm sorry, enumerated types. Um, I'm still stuck in C++ where they're called enums. Uh, wrapper classes is the last topic we'll be covering. A variable holds either a primitive type, data type, or a reference to an object. So we can use a class name such as string in the example we're about to cover. Uh, we can use that class name as a type to declare an object reference variable. This does not create an object, okay? It declares an object reference variable. An object reference variable holds the address of an object. However, the object must be created using the class constructor, which we will cover next. Hold on. Uh, typically, we use the new operator when we want to create an object, as in the example here, title equals new. So we're creating a new instance of the string class in this example. And new calls the string constructor, which is a method that sets up the object. Okay. When we create an object, it's, an, it's called an instantiation. And an object is an instance of a particular class. So in this case, title is an instance of the string class. In the previous slide, we said we typically or usually use the new operator. But because strings are so common, we don't have to use the new operator to create a string object. This is a special syntax that works only for strings. So here is an example, title equals, and then you um, include the string between the double quotes. Um, and that the text or the characters enclosed in the double quotes are called a string literal. And they represent a string object. Once an object has been instantiated, we can use the dot operator to invoke its methods. A method um, may or may not return a value, which can be used in the example here in an assignment statement or an expression. So a method invocation is um, can be thought of as asking an object to perform a service. So in this case, the object is title. The method being invoked is the length method. There's no argument being passed. And the length method does return an integer value that is then assigned to the variable count. And obviously, the length is the length or number of characters uh, in the string. Now let's discuss the difference between an object variable and a primitive variable. A primitive variable contains the value itself. However, an object variable contains the address of the object. You can think of this as an object reference or as a pointer to the location of the object. 
So rather than dealing with arbitrary addresses, we often depict a reference graphically. So in this example, you've got a primitive variable, well, a graphic depiction of a primitive variable named num1. Obviously, it's an integer. And it contains the value 38. However, the object variable name one contains the address of the string object that contains that holds the literal Steve Jobs string literal. Sorry. In the next couple slides, we will revisit the assignment operator as used with both primitive and object variables. So when we have primitive types, an assignment takes a copy of the value and stores it in a variable. So for example, in this, um, this slide, we have two integer variables named num1 and num2. num1 has been assigned or holds the value 38, num2 96. And then we execute the statement num2 equals num1. So the value in num1 is assigned to the variable num2. And then you can see where it says after each variable, which has its own space allocated, holds the value 38. So the value 96 is gone. This is uh, how an assignment works with primitive data types. Next, we'll take a look at how an assignment works with object variables. So in this example, we have two object variables, which are references. They are named name one and name two. And name one points to the object holding the literal, the string literal Steve Jobs, and name two points to the object as a reference to the object holding the string literal Steve Wozniak. And then we use the assignment operator in the same statement, name two equals name one. But instead of them being primitive variables, they're object variables. And what we've done is we've assigned the address or the reference in name one to name two. So now both object references or object variables are referencing the same string literal. <clears throat> Given the situation we just covered, <clears throat> we were left <clears throat> with two references referring to the same object. This is, these are called, <clears throat> when you have more than one reference to the same object, they're called aliases of each other. Uh, this is a, an interesting situation. So one object can be accessed using multiple reference variables. Okay, This can be useful, but should be managed very carefully. Changing an object through one reference changes it for all of its aliases. Because in the end, if you think about it, there's really only one object. And it's being referred to by multiple aliases. So you could see where this could be problematic. Next, let's talk about garbage collection. Uh, garbage occurs when an object can no longer be referenced. It, has no, it no longer has any valid references and the program can't access it. So it becomes useless and becomes gar what's called garbage. Java performs automatic garbage collection. Other languages, the programmer is responsible for performing garbage collection, which means deallocating the memory that was previously allocated to an object. 
um, Java automatically returns the object's memory to the system. And this is called automatic garbage collection. Very useful. Once a string object has been created, um, its value cannot be changed and its length cannot be changed. And this is uh, said that the object of the string class is immutable. Um, there are several methods available to the string class, objects of the string class that return subset string objects that are modified versions of the original. But they do not change the original string. One way to think about a string is a series of concatenated characters into the string object. And each character within the string has a specific numeric index. And as you might have guessed, the indexes begin at zero. So the first character in every string has an index of zero. So in the, in the example on this slide, the string hello, capital H-E-L-L-O, -L -L the character H is located at index zero. And the O, the last character in this string, is located at index four. Here we have examples of some methods available to objects of the string class. Uh, the string constructor creates a new string object with the same characters as um, str. Um, we can uh, return caret is a method that returns the character at a specific index, and the index has to be an integer. Um, uh, compared to returns an integer, indicating if the string is lexically before a negative return value equal to or lexically after the string. And they compare them one character at a time until one is considered to be greater than, um, less than, or ultimately equal to. Um, concat returns a new string consisting of the string can concat concatenated uh, with str. Uh, Boolean returns true if the string contains the same characters as str. Um, equal is ignore case. True if the string contains the same character as str without regard to case. So it's case independent. So a capital um, SOLD would be equal to S lowercase s o l d in that case. Length returns a number of characters in the string. Uh, replace replaces old character with new character and returns a new string that is identical except for the replacement. It does not change the original string. Um, remember, the strings are immutable. Um, I'm not going to go through the rest. Uh, two upper case and two lower case are very similar to those you saw in C++. So take a close look at these. We'll be using these um, later on in the class. On this slide, we have a program that demonstrates um, creation of a string named phrase. And notice we're not using the new operator because we can do that only with strings. And then we're declaring some string variables named mutation one, mutation two, mutation three, and mutation four. We're printing um, a string literal original string and concatenating that with phrase and then concatenating it with double quotes. And we're also calling the um, length method in the next line, which is a print line uh, method call and we're concatenating uh, the string literal length of string colon space uh, with the um, return value from the method call to length which i believe is 20 but we'll find out next 
And then we're assigning um, uh, we're assigning strings to mutation one, mutation two, mutation three, and mutation four. Remember, these are uh, most likely subsets. So first we're calling concat and we're concatenating phrase along with the string literal, except comma, space, except from vending machines, period. And that will return a new string. It will not change the immutable phrase. And that new string will be assigned to mutation one. And then we're going to take mutation one and call the two upper method and assign the new string returned uh, to mutation two. And then we're calling muta mutation two is calling the replace method. And we're replacing capital E with capital X, assigning that to the string mutation three. And then mutation three is calling the substring three comma 30 is the argument being passed. So it will take from index three to 30 and extract those from mutation three, which is already a very significantly different string than we started with and assign it to mutation four. And then we're going to print all of them along with um, string literals identifying which ones they are on the next slide. I have a screen capture from the IDE running this program. So take a close look at this and I'll also uh, place a zipped copy of this project in the timeline for Canvas for you to look around at. Take care. So here we have queued up the string mutation demo program that we reviewed on the previous slide, I have it in the ID and I'm doing a screen capture just so you can see this thing running. And here's the code um, that we went over uh, in the previous slide. And I'll show you the output. I'll run this right now. It's all ready to go. So there you go. Okay. Original string. Okay. System dot out the print line original string concatenate it with phrase concatenate it with a um, double quote okay then we have another call to the print line method and we're concatenating the string literal length of string plus a call to the length method which returns 20. then we assign the return from the concat method call phrase dot concat and we can cat it concatenate it with this string literal here assign that to mutation one then mutation one calls the two upper method and assigns the returned string to mutation two then mutation two calls the replace method and replaces all instances of the character capital E with capital X so the string returned is going to be dramatically different than uh, mutation two and that's assigned to mutation three and then mutation three calls the uh, method substring and we extract uh, the characters from index three to 30 and assign that to mutation four and then we're simply using the print line method to output uh, each uh, string mutation one mutation two mutation three mutation four concatenated with uh, string literals that identify which one we have and the last call to print line is mutated length concatenated with mutation four calling the length method and here's the output take a look at this and um, if you want i'll put a uh, copy of the compressed project in the timeline session and you could run it yourself. So next we're going to talk about class libraries and the Java API. API stands for Application Program Interface and the Java API is a standard class library 
uh, included in any part or in part of any Java development environment. And a class library is a collection of classes that can be used when developing programs. Um, some of the classes that we've already used, which are part of the Java API, include system, scanner, and string. And there's other class libraries that can be obtained um, through vendors, third party vendors, or you can create your own class libraries. And we'll get to that later. The classes of the Java API are organized into packages. And here are here we have a list of packages and the support that those packages provide. Uh, Java.applet allows us to create small programs or applets that are easily transported across the web. AWT, uh, Java.AWT is graphics and GUIs, graphical user interfaces. Uh, Beans, Java.Beans. Um, uh, Java.IO is a, is a variety of IO functions. Java.Lang is general support and it's automatically imported in all the Java programs. Math, calculations um, with uh, high precision. Uh, .NET is a um, package used to communicate across a network. And I could go on and on and on and on. SQL um, is uh, a Java package used for interacting with databases. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. Uh, I've taught that in our database management class and various other classes for years. And uh, so uh, take a look at this slide we will get into all of these in great detail later in this class and the follow-up class here we cover the various import declarations used um, when you want to use a class from a package it's a couple different ways you could use its fully qualified name so for example java.util.scanner will allow you to use the scanner uh, class. Or you can import the entire class and then just use the class name. So you use import java.util.scanner. If you want to import all classes in a particular package, you use the wildcard character. So import java.util. And then the wildcard, which, which is an asterisk, will import all classes in the util package. Here we have two fully coded Java import declaration statements. One, so you've got the Java keyword import. The package name is java.util, and then a dot followed by the class name. In this case, it would be random. Or dot wildcard will import all of the classes in the well in that in this particular example it's the AWT class. Every class within the java.lang package is automatically imported into all programs. Um, you don't need to import java.lang dot asterisk. It's but although every program you create in the IDE uh, will act as though that statement is there. And it's the reason why we didn't have to import the system or the string classes in the earlier programs that we've been looking at. The scanner class, however, is part of the java.util package, and therefore that has to be imported in our projects. The random class is also part of the java.util package, and it provides methods used to generate pseudo random numbers. At this point in your computer science education, you should understand that computers cannot generate a truly random number. They generate numbers that are extremely random-like or pseudo random. So a random object 
performed some very complicated calculations based on a seed value to produce a stream of seemingly random values. But computers, once again, are not capable of, um, of creating purely random values. It's a debate that I sometimes enjoy having with students, but we'll leave that for another time. Here we take a look at um, some methods available to objects of the random class. Uh, random is the constructor, which creates a new pseudo random number generator. Uh, next float is a method that returns a random number between 0.0, .0 and 1.0 a floating point uh, random number. Uh, there are two versions of nextint, one with no argument that returns a random integer number ranges over all possible values. And then um, uh, nextint, the version that takes one argument, an integer number, and returns a random number, random integer between the range of zero and that num minus one. So uh, here we have a, a fully coded statement uh, where num variable equals or is assigned uh, and you've got the syntax. The random object is called generator. Its name is generator. And then we're calling next int with the argument 20. And that will uh, return an integer in the range of 0 to 20 minus 1 or 0 to 19. And then we are shifting, we are adding 10 to that. So we will actually get a num will hold a value, a random value, pseudo random value in the range of 10 to 29. Here we have a program that utilizes the random numbers uh, random number objects we just discussed. And I'll take you through this here. Of course, we have this reminder, which keeps popping up every time I do one of these videos. I apologize. So here, we're using the new constructor to um, create a new random object named the generator. We're also declaring an int num1 and a float num2 to primitive variables. And here we're calling next int the method that does not require an argument to generate a random integer variable and assign it to num1. And then we will use the print line method to print a random integer concatenated with num1. And you can see I have a session that I've already run here. Down below, you can see the output, a random integer, and it generated this long looks like 64,493,250. That will change each time we run this again. So then we call next int the method that requires an integer argument and we pass 10 to it and it will return an integer from 0 to 9. On this run it returns 8. Then, let me get a little alignment here. Then, we shift that by one. We add one to that random number from zero to nine, and it becomes one to 10. And you could see from one to 10, and we generated a four on this run, okay? Then we shift we pass 15 to next int, which would give us a number from 0 to 14. And we shift it by 20, which will give us a number from 20 
to 34. And on this run, we generated a 27. We do it again, 0 to 19, and we shift it in the negative direction, so negative 10 to 9. And the number generated, or passed, I should say, assigned to num1, is negative 6. Finally, we call the method next float. And we generate a number between 0 and 1, and that becomes 0.487.96445. And then we call next float again and multiply it by 6, and that will give us a value between 1 and 6. Um, so I hope this is useful. I'll put this code in the timeline in Canvas and we'll be able to uh, take a look at it in person. The math class is a class included in the java.lang package. It contains methods uh, for performing mathematical functions including absolute value square root, exponentiation, and trigonometric functions. Let's take a closer look. Here's a new term for you, static methods, methods, also called class methods. The methods in the class, I'm sorry, in the math class, are static methods, which means they can be invoked without the use of an object name. You just simply use the class name. So here's an example, value equals math.cos cosine 90. So where the object name would go, we put the class name math. And because we're passing an integer 90 to cosine, we'll get the cosine of 90 degrees being assigned to value. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed the right-hand side, plus math.square root of delta. Uh, once again, we're taking a square root of the value stored in delta. We're not calling an object, and we're adding that to math.cosine90 and assigning that to value. We'll discuss static methods um, in more detail later. Here's a list of some methods included in the math class. No big surprises here. Uh, they look very similar to the member functions, including in the CMath class in the C++ um, CMath library. I'm not going to go over each one of these. Take a close look. We'll be using most, if not all, of these. Hello, students. This is a screen capture of the quadratic program, <clears throat> which I'll place in the timeline in Canvas for you to run on your own computer. It demonstrates the use of the math class to perform a calculation based upon user input. What this does, it calculates the roots for a quadratic equation with user input for A, B, and C. Um, quadratic equation being ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. So um, you can see we uh, use the new operator to create a scanner, uh, a new scanner object called scan. And uh, to solicit input from the user, we prompt the user uh, to enter the coefficient of x squared, and then we use the scan object to solicit the next int and assign the return value to a, uh, which is an integer. Um, we use the scan object with the next int method, and we assign the return value to b, and then do the same for c. So we get the coefficient of x squared in A, x in B, and um, the constant in C. 
and then if I scroll down you'll see the actual use of some of the math class objects. So here <clears throat> we're using pow. Um, we're just stating the class and we're calculating b squared minus 4ac and assigning the return <clears throat> to the discriminant and then root number one equals negative b plus all of that uh, the square root of all of that divided by 2a and you'll see root one and root two are calculated and then we use um, system out the print line to print root pound root number one colon and then we concatenate the integer I'm sorry the root one is not an integer root one is a double sorry about that the double value of root one with that string literal we do the same with root two like I said this will be in the timeline the source file is yours you should use it put it into a project and um, run it So now we'll run this program and we'll use the quadratic equation x squared minus 5x plus 6 as the input to solve for the roots. And you can clearly see the roots of x squared minus 5x plus 6 are going to be 3 and 2. But let's run the program. Coefficient of x squared is going to be 1. The coefficient of x is going to be negative 5. And then the constant is going to be 6. And the roots are 3 and 2 as expected. So as I mentioned earlier, this will be in the timeline of Canvas for you to download and run on your own. Um, take a close look at it. It's, um, it's really important that you understand how to use the math class because we're going to be using it extensively throughout this class. Next, we're going to take a look at a program called Purchase. And it's already been placed in the timeline for Canvas. So you'll be able to take this source code and uh, run it on your own computer. But this demonstrates the use of the number format class to format output. So you'll see that we're importing java.txt number format that's a specific class within the text package and we're also importing java.util scanner so we can um, solicit io our input uh, from the user and send output to the monitor so we're going to declare a constant variable using the final keyword it's a double called tax rate and it's 0 0.06. This represents a 6% tax. And an integer quantity, and then uh, four doubles, subtotal tax, total cost, and unit price. Create a new scanner object called scan, um, connected to our keyboard so we can solicit input from the user. And then here you're going to see use of the number format uh, class. We're going to create two objects, FMT1, which stands for Format1, and FMT2. And we're going to use a number format.get currency instance for the first one. And we'll be using that to specify um, currency output, dollar sign dot or xx dot xx. And we're also going to have format 2 for the percent instance. And you'll see how these work in just a second. OK, so we'll prompt the user to enter the quantity. Uh, we'll solicit quantity from the user using scan.nextint. 
and will prompt the user to enter the unit price and that's a double so we'll use um, scan we'll call the next double method and the return value will be used to initialize unit price subtotal uh, equals quantity times unit price tax equals subtotal times the constant tax rate and total cost equals subtotal plus the tax and then here is the use of the number format objects we're going to send output so we'll send the string literal subtotal space and we'll concatenate that and the format object we'll call the format method and it requires a um, an argument be passed we're going to pass subtotal and that will return subtotal in currency format and we're also going to have a second line of output uh, string literal tax plus uh, format one dot format dot the tax that will be currency format at and then format two remember is percent instance so format two object will call format method pass tax rate and that will be returned using the format to um, percent instance so and then we're going to total we're going to send to the the monitor total plus format one dot format total cost let's um, let's run this I uh, will just do a quantity of 10 I will say the unit price is 25.25 uh, $25 $25.25 and then our subtotal is that 25.25 times 10 but notice it is now in currency format our tax is $15.15 .15 at currency format and then six percent that is um, tax rate which 0 0.06 output in percent format and then we've got our total so uh, like I said this is in the timeline in canvas you can run this program uh, which I suggest you do next we'll take a look at the decimal format class which is used for formatting floating point values you can specify uh, that the number be uh, output to a certain number of decimal places and the constructor of the decimal format class takes a string representing a pattern for the formatted number and then outputs the appropriate um, formatted number we'll take a closer look here we see three methods of the decimal format class first one is the constructor which creates a new decimal format object uh, given the specified pattern uh, we've got apply pattern which applies the specified pattern to the decimal formatted object and uh, we also have um, format which returns a string uh, containing the specified numbered format according to the current pattern and we're going to take a look at these next in a fully coded program next we're going to take a look at the decimal format class which is in the java.txt package and you'll see it works very similarly to the last uh, number format we looked at so here I want to bring your attention uh, decimal format dot fmt that's the object we're creating it's a new decimal form so we call the constructor decimal format and here is the argument that we need to pass um, it will specify the number of decimal places that decimal numbers floats in and doubles we'll assume when they're being sent to the output so real simple what this circle stats project does 
is it calculates the area and their circumference. You can see area and circumference. And um, area equals uh, pi r squared. Their circumference is uh, 2 times 2 pi r. So we um, then output the circle's area plus the string literal the circle's area plus uh, the object FMT calls format area is the argument and then we've got circumference also sent to circumference and the object returns the argument in the appropriate format and in this case it's going to three, be three decimal places so watch I'll run this and once again before I run this I shouldn't have to say this but this is in the timeline in uh, chapter three under, I'm sorry, under chapter three in Canvas. So let's run this. Uh, radius is an integer. So I'll just enter six, whatever unit it is. And there we go. The circle's area, 113.097. Circle circumference, 37.699. If I were to come back here and change this to um, four decimal places. I'll have to save this project and rerun it. You'll see the output is now four decimal places. Pretty straightforward. As we had in C++, Java has a um, enumerated or enum data type uh, used to declare variables of enum type. Um, the enumerated type establishes all possible values for uh, that type of variable. The values are identifiers of your own choosing uh, user defined names. Here's the following declaration, which creates a new, an enum type called season. And season has four possible values, winter, spring, summer, fall. Enum, the, the name of the enum variable and the four potential values. And you can have any number of values uh, listed or included in an enum type. So once an enum type is defined, a variable um, of that type can be declared. Here's an example where we're We've already uh, defined a season, enum, and we're declaring a variable called time, or name time. And then it can be assigned a value, time equals season.fall. The values have to be one of the initial values declared. Um, so you can't assign any value other than those listed in the original enum, in enum type declaration. Um, each of the values of an enum is stored internally as an integer, and that's called its ordinal value. And as you may have guessed, uh, the first is a zero, second a one. So if you have, you know, 10 values um, declared in your enum type, they're going to be, their ordinal value will be zero through nine. You cannot assign a numeric value to an enum type, even if it corresponds to a valid ordinal value. It's not going to work. It's illegal. The declaration of an enum type is a special type of class, and each of the variables uh, is of that particular type is an object. And so that object can call the ordinal method, which returns the ordinal value. And the name method returns the name of the identifier corresponding to the object's value. As you're probably expecting, here's a short program to demonstrate the use of the enum enumerated type. Um, we declare an enum flavor and we assign values vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, fudge ripple, coffee, 
Rocky Road, mint chocolate chip, and cookie dough. And so then uh, we use flavor to create uh, four objects, enum objects, cone one, cone two, cone three. Cone one gets assigned mint chocolate chip. Cone two, flavor.chocolate. Cone three, flavor.vanilla. If you download this code directly from the uh, textbook website, it's going to be different because I've made some changes to this. So system.out.println, literal, uh, string literal, cone one value plus cone one. Then we're going to cone one ordinal plus cone one calls the uh, ordinal method, which will return the ordinal value of cone one mint chocolate chip should be zero one two three four five six okay uh cone two value cone two cone two ordinal and cone two has chocolate which should be zero one ordinal value call the name um main name method will return the name um, and then I print out code one, cone one, cone two, cone three, and then a line now assign cone one to cone three. We can actually assign um, cone one to cone three, and then we print that out, and you'll see what happens. I'll run this right now for you. Cone one value mint chocolate chip, cone one ordinal six, cone one name mint chocolate chip, cone two value chocolate. Ordinal one, remember, it starts with zero, and in this particular code, zero would have been vanilla. Uh, cone three, value vanilla. Cone three, ordinal zero, there you go. Uh, and then now assign cone one to cone three, and then cone three, value, mint chocolate chip, new ordinal, etc. cetera. Uh, as you might have guessed, this will be in the timeline. So you can download it and run it on your own computer. Um, last but not least, we're getting to wrapper classes. Um, no, I probably think we have auto boxing after this, um, but that's minimal. Uh, the java.lang package contains uh, wrapper classes that correspond to each primitive data type. And you'll see a wrapper class provides these primitive data types with some methods uh, that are extremely useful. Uh, we'll take a close look, but each primitive type has a wrapper class and you'll see the only difference is that the wrapper class is capitalized. Now we're going to drill down on wrapper classes. Uh, here's a declaration that creates an integer um, instance of the integer wrapper class. Um, and we, you'll see the new constructor, the integer age equals new integer assigned an initial value of 40. Now you're going to see by doing it this way, we're going to have access to member functions that the primitive integer lowercase i would not have access to. It can be an object of a specific wrapper class can be used in a situation where primitive value is just not uh, complex enough. Uh, some of these objects serve as collections of other objects and primitive values could not be stored in such collections, but wrapper objects can be. And you'll see that as we progress further in the class, you're gonna see some specific examples coming up. Wrapper classes contain static methods that help manage um, the associated data type. For example, the integer wrapper class contains a method to convert an integer stored in a string to an int value, lowercase int value. Here's a line of code uh, where the right-hand side is being assigned to an, an int already declared named num. So you've got integer.parseInt and you pass a string and that string will then be converted and stored in num. The wrapper class 
often contains useful constants. Uh, an example, the integer wrapper class contains min value and max value, which hold the smallest and largest integer values. Here we have some methods of the, of the integer wrapper class. Obviously, you have the constructor, which we've already covered. And then we have one, two, three, four, five uh, methods that return the value of the integer as a corresponding primitive type. You got byte, double, float, int, and long are the return types of um, those particular methods. So the, the, the wrapper object would call one of those methods and it would return a byte, double, float, int, long, etc. You also have the um, parseInt method, which takes a string um, that has to be in integer format, but stored as a string and returns that as an int. And then we have three other methods um, that return a string representation of the specified integer value in the corresponding base. So, so we can get a binary string, a hex string, or an octal string um, by passing the particular uh, wrapper object to um, those methods, either one of those methods. And last but certainly not least is the concept of autoboxing. Autoboxing is the automatic conversion of a primitive value to its corresponding wrapper object. So a primitive integer when on the right hand side of an assignment statement with a uh, wrapper integer object on the left hand side will do the automatic conversion. So here we have three lines, three simple lines of code where we declare an integer wrapper object called OBJ. And we've got the declaration of a primitive integer named num, and it's being assigned 42 as its uh, default integer value. By assigning num to obj, we automatically convert the primitive value to the wrapper object data type. And then we can use all of the uh, methods associated with that wrapper object.